Welcome to the Surveyor Hub podcast, the podcast for surveyors who just love what they do. I'm Marion Ellis, and in today's podcast, we're catching up with Gavin O'Neill, CEO of Go Report. Gavin is a chartered engineer, and I was interested in his expertise in business improvement, change management, and all things systems, and how that's applied or can be applied to the way that surveyors use technology in their practice. And you know what? He's just a really nice chap to have a good chat to. So here we go. Welcome to the podcast, Gavin. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Now, I just said to you, we're going to go straight into this because we are both talkers. And I don't we want are to miss indeed. A, I don't want to miss a thing. It's, it's a, a, <laughs> it's a debate who, who, who can get a word in edgeways. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. Uh, 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 interrupting. And I'm terrible for that. Anybody who's listened to the podcast before will know that I interrupt a lot and I can't help it. But there you go. Gavin, introduce yourself for people who have no idea who you are. Thank you very much, which I, I suspect is is a lot of people. Well, I'm Gavin O'Neill, CEO of Go Report. Uh, I guess really the the introducing yourself comes from uh, my origin story, really how I end eventually ended up at Go Report, and it really you know I started out. Uh, I grew up tripping after my father on building sites from about the age of five. He was a a joiner, and then later in life became a, a contracts manager, or in reality, an estates manager, looking after hundreds of different types of properties, from bars to restaurants, hotels, shops, warehouses, and and residential blocks. So it's it's fair to say I got an amazing exposure during that time to what goes into working in those environments uh, and the amazing and varied people that work in all aspects of construction, maintenance and, and in operating assets, both good and bad, I have to say. But every holiday period, I was fortunate enough to get access to work experience with structural engineers, refrigeration engineers, metal fabrication, building firms, etc. And, and through all of that, I decided that mechanical engineering was the path that I wanted to to take. So I studied mechanical engineering, then traveled, then went back to do a master's in environmental engineering before getting a job designing and building water treatment works, if you uh, if you can believe that. So I did that for about seven years, becoming chartered along the way. But really, while I was doing that, and one of the amazing benefits of, a, of an engineering chartership program is that you get to experience all aspects of a business. I became much more drawn to the operation of the business and the execution of projects rather than the detailed design on, a, on an, any one. And that got me into troubleshooting and improving business processes and, and, and systems. You know, I kind of I looked around my little open plan cubicle whenever I arrived as a sort of a 23, 24 year old. And the other three guys there, it was only after about two weeks I realized they were actually the authors of the books that we were learning from at university. Wow. So I was, I was like, really, that's that's you know, that's fantastic, but it's probably not me, um, really. So, so information flow has always been key to any any type of uh, of project historically. It doesn't matter how far you go back; information flow is is key. But really, at that time, the internet, software, and hardware technology were all evolving in a manner that required really careful consideration and adoption to to remain competitive. And I guess I was kind of quite well placed at that point through having worked with lots of different types of people at all different levels of construction as well as an interest in uh, in new technologies and um, I, I kind of got sort of put into that role in the business so I was really a purchaser of software and an implementer of change programs long before I was a producer and seller of software so so to speak so I, I think it's fair to say I know both sides of the equation fairly well after a number of years of doing that I worked in a number of industries before switching to the software side of problem solving and then I've been doing that now for for 20 years nearly Oh, wow. There's so many questions I could ask there, but bizarre, <laughs> bizarrely, some of it resonates. You mentioned the authors of the books that you I had the same when I was at Blue Box. Mm-hmm. You know, um, mm-hmm. I've got a book, I wouldn't say first edition, <laughs> but an early uh, edition <laughs> of the year it came out, Phil Parnham and Chris Rispin's mm-hmm. uh, and the gang's book. Uh, and I got them to uh, to sign it. And it was really intimidating being with these amazing people who'd written these books and do I fit in or not? Am I as good as them? You know, uh, amazing, amazing people that you realize are normal people too, you know, that really normal. 
Absolutely. You know, you look you, you you look at the references and their lists and how many times they were kind of flown around the world to speak at, at particular things. And they're the guys saying, uh, yeah, you have a problem with that. Can I help you? You know, really fantastic, fantastic people to learn from. Try being their boss. <laughs> 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 I I always remember sending, um, I'm sorry what might be saying, bless him, he's retired now, um, Phil Parnham. We were doing a, a road show and he wanted his wanted his slides in a certain format. And so I forwarded it on to the secretary and said, he's a bit particular about his slides. And I'd, and I'd copied him in. Yes, I am particular about my slides, Marion. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get off to a good start, but it got, it, it did get better. Yeah, so that, that totally resonates. And also being young and that you're involved in technology or you must know about all the technology that's out there. I was working at Countrywide when they brought out the first tablet technology. That was, what, 2004, five, something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I knew nothing about <laughs> technology and internet and email and, and, and those things back then, they're all being quite, quite new. But because I'd seen a coloured computer screen, I was like streets ahead yeah. <laughs> compared yeah. to others. Yeah. And so I would go out and audit other surveyors and show them how to use the tablet. And I learned so much about surveying and not so much from the technical side, but the whole approach. And it made me feel such a good surveyor. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> the things that I, that I knew, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there there is that aspect of the sort of young equals technically sort of competent kind of thing. But I really, and probably for yourself as well, you kind of fell back onto your your education principles. You know, from an engineering principle, it's about problem solving. It's about considering all of the facts and information. And it's about revisiting those facts as you as you look towards problems. So I think really the key thing was, you know, I wasn't a, you know, I wasn't technology for technology's sake. I was a problem solver. And in order to solve problems, you you need to have that right combination of people process and the tools that you give them. So I think that's that's kind of where it started. I started. I, I was put in. Really, it was I was put in. Made responsible for a troubleshooting exercise where we we'd managed to build a, a very large concrete tank in the wrong place. And anybody, you know, you don't have to be an engineer to work out water doesn't flow uphill very well. Put it that way. And it was quite a quite a costly mistake. So the 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 problem was, you know, how do we stop this happening again? And it required digging in quite deep. And it also required talking to people who didn't necessarily want to share information with you because they feared blame, retribution, whatever it happened to be. But I was just very focused on, well, how do we stop it happening again? You know, what what tools, what processes can we put in place? And as it turned out, it was it was one of those situations where it was nobody's fault, but the processes and the tools available to people didn't make it easy for them to make the right calls and the right decisions at the right time. So once we, you know, we did that and that that was kind of my grinding in it. And once I kind of finished that project was like, okay, well, there's a, there's actually a role here for, for that. And, and for where we want to go, it's a very large business. So it, it, it had um, advantages with, with scope and reach at that point. That's interesting. I'm going to say that a lot now. now I've chewed into <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm very happy you are. I, I do hope that, <laughs> I do hope the listeners feel so the same way. I literally, I haven't had a glass of, glass of wine. I've uh, just had a cheese sandwich. and <laughs> <laughs> But um, I find this interesting because when we rolled out this new tablet technology you know, 20 years ago now, every you know everything was engineered and processed and we had to map how the site notes that Surveyor took, they had to be redesigned and everything. Mm-hmm. And then you had to match all like the lender's forms over it. And it became the most over-engineered, complicated yeah. thing yeah. ever because you looked at the processes that you had and tried to make them fit. And I remember being told we have to click and chill Wait for it to load, <laughs> to load up. <laughs> but also there was the we had, so there were online site notes and those that worked in Countrywide back in the day might remember this. But there was a page and it was called the CSQs client specific questions and it was everything that didn't fall into the you know the standard mm-hmm. uh, site notes from for mortgage valuation and there were loads of them and the, some of the questions when you read them in in isolation and you know not understanding the lender's guidance sometimes. You weren't sure whether it was a yes or no. Yeah. Do I tick the box or not? And the how a question could be implied and do you and so, you know, there's one thing to fill out, you know, do your inspection and then fill out a report, a lender's report. It's another to fill out the report while you're going around on site, given how the questions could be phrased and uh, mm-hmm. and interpreted. And and 
engineering and processes get you so far, but we're all human yeah, at the absolutely. end of the day. Yeah. And well, if, if there wasn't a human, peril, I think. Yeah, I think if there wasn't a human aspect, the job would be automated. That's that's the point, really. If 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 a human doesn't require uh, to apply their expertise or decision making on a on a on a process, it it can be automated. It's not to say it will be automated, but it can be automated. And there's one thing that I've coming into surveying. I, I joined Go Report uh, about four years ago, and one of the things that you know I'm very passionate about is increasing the perception of the value of the surveying community, both residential and commercial, because we work across both both sectors. Is that it's not something that's ripe for commoditization. It's not about commodity. Monetization. Our entire workflow really is built around the kind of preparation, the actual site, physical being at the asset property or, or, or otherwise, and then the edit and review stage, which is your stage for reflective thought. So any technology, and, I, and we do come across this where people have adopted maybe the wrong digital, is it's driven them in that commoditized route. They haven't been able to express what they need to do as either part of their workflow or in what they're recording. And good technology does good digital doesn't do that good digital gives you the flexibility to 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 allow your expertise to shine through we, we, and we know it works because we have over you know 450 clients um you know our business is split about 50 50 um residential and commercial and out of the residential clients that we have you know there are you know many of them have been guests on your your podcast you know they're surveying royalty you know the likes of zoe baker and james brooke at novello and uh, and zoe your fair and, and and many many others you know they are they're all doing the job kind of thing uh and and they're all excellent surveyors so we we are very cautious about when we introduce enhancements into the product, does it, you know, like any tool, does it fit in your hand? You know, software is no different. Does it fit in your flow? And also um, taking people when they've had a bad experience to sort of re, uh, re-inform them about what a good experience looks like. You're right. It's a tool at the end of the day. Absolutely. And if you if you don't know, I mean, and this is, a, this is always tricky because, of course, we know how to inspect buildings and what our routine is. But unless you've written it down step by step and really understand, well, why do you start here and finish there? And why do we do it this way around? Is it because it's the most efficient way? Is it because it's the right way? Is it because the client, we get the best out of the client if we do it uh, that way? If you don't know that and take the time, then whatever you do, you know, whether it's using software for, for site inspections or even from an administration point of view, anything that you then move over to digital is going to fail because you don't understand what you you need and mm-hmm. you know it's that whole garbage in garbage out absolutely business. Yeah. but then you real then you realize how weak <laughs> how how bad or how where the gaps are and, and that's what we we learned sort of back in the day with the first tablet technology was that you know at the time we had something like 850 surveyors who all did it differently mm-hmm. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. and so bringing things in line where you can where you can automate it when you can standardize that that helps to a point but it should never replace you know the decision making should uh, only that, enhance that needs to happen. should only yeah. ever enhance decision making it should only ever support decision making and i think that the really interesting thing about <clears throat> one of the many interesting things about the residential sector you're you can be a sole trader who produces the exact same product as a very large company, effectively to the to the consumer? <clears throat> There's not many industries like that where you 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 can. It's a little bit different on the commercial side because resource and capability come into it, so it's slight slightly more difficult to be a sole trader in that in that sense. Although there are specialists, obviously, but as as a sole trader, you know you are kind of the arbitrator of of your own quality, your own production, your own work winning, uh, your own client liaison, all of those sorts of things. And, you know, the big difference is when you kind of move into sort of slightly larger businesses or corporates, you're, you have to overlay on top of that, well, consistency across multiple people doing the same job, compliance, quality, the fact that you've got people of different levels and experience operating, uh, all of those sorts of things. So, you you know, our solution is used by sole traders, as as well as large corporates because the bit that we focus on we would class ourselves as kind of a best of breed solution you know our, our mantra is do what we do really well and play really nice with the other kids around our of the workflow hence we've got a very you know an integration strategy with with other tools and an information strategy with other tools and the reason being is we want to we want to really excel at what we do and, and free up more time for the art of surveying effectively. So the only bit we're trying to help with uh, and enhance is 
removing duplication, assisting the surveyor as they as they work within a within a property, capturing the information once and proving accuracy at source, and then obviously because the, the solution is not just the, about the site, it's about the, the you know the preparation before you go and the reflective thought and the the publication of of the report and that side of things, is also overlaying a, a, an opportunity for QA as well and, and and kind of proliferating over the top of that. So, so that's kind of where we're you know where we're at is you know anything that we we develop does it enhance the experience of the surveyor and obviously we've got a we've got a lot of surveyors who we're talking to every day that help us with that you know you mentioned consistency quality one of my roles back in the day was audit manager you know and trying to get 850 people to do the same thing <laughs> or to write the wall thickness in a lender's <laughs> <laughs> report which was you know this was pre the last crash is it is nigh on impossible it's um it's re- it is really difficult but you do touch there on the need for quality the need for risk and understanding your risk because if you've got people doing different things at different times in different ways there is a risk that somebody could do it better or worse and you then get a claim or you get you get a problem and i guess that's where i see a lot of firms i'm going to say mini corporate which is, sounds quite derogatory but it's more that people set themselves up but the only model that they know is a corporate one yeah and so they set themselves up like that thinking we've got to get everybody to do the same thing in the right way and work certain certain hours when you're working with human beings and actually it is okay for different hours it is okay to start outside rather than inside on your your survey the more you know yourself better and take control of that and work as a, a team. I mean, you know, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be certain things that you do, but there's best practice and you agree for consistency what, you know, what everybody wants to do. But the difference is you agree rather than being told, mm-hmm. you know, you mm-hmm. must stand on one leg when you draw something <laughs> or take a picture of a, of a of a roof. Because that's where it becomes a bit sort of, you know, a bit more corporate-like in terms of you've got to get it done in a in a certain way. And there are reasons why that ha- that has to happen, particularly when you've got panel contracts with lenders, you know, who are the clients and what, what they want. When it works, it works. So I think it's a lot harder for some of these smaller firms, unless you're all on board. And that's where it gets yeah. disjointed. Yeah, I mean, I think I think risk comes at a multi-layered a, a approach, really, isn't it? You know, there's there's risk of if you're a if you're a sole trader and you are kind of doing work that could be more easily produced for you or your start points could be better you, there's that risk of wasted time and that that time is it's maybe robbing you of your work-life balance but it's also maybe robbing you of your ability to grow your business um and, and do more so there's a there's a risk there you know there's a there's a risk when you've got multiple surveyors of people operating in different ways you know it's the same wasted time but it's also the fact that you are slightly more exposed if one person is saying one thing in the business and another person is saying something contradictory how do you reconcile that uh, effectively there's a risk of 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 change you know whenever something new comes to light how quickly can you get everybody understanding what that change is and how you should deal with it you know so digital as we look at it, you know, we we would say we we support all of those things and and help with all of those things because ultimately it's not about turning a, an individual into a robot. It's just about giving them the environment where they can excel uh, uh, as a surveyor effectively. I kind of think of it this way: you shouldn't really have to think creatively about how you produce the thing that you do all the time. You should think creatively about the job in front of you, the property in front of you, the asset in front of you. That's what you should be spending your time on and removing the other the wasted time on the other aspects. I'd like to ask you about Go Report then and how it how it got started. So I, you know, at any event I see you there, you mm-hmm. sponsor all sorts of, of different things. How how did it come about? What you know? What's yeah. the origins of it? And explain. okay, so uh, from a technology point of view, we're we're a digital data collection, reporting, and uh, an analysis tool. From a practical point of view, we're a business solution that supports how surveyors work, provides benefit around efficiency, consistency, quality, and capability that we've that we've just been talking about. You know, as I say, I've never really been an advocate of technology for technology's sake. I'm not one of the kind of people that, you know, picks up the next bleeding edge thing and said, this is going to change the world kind of thing. I always come back to my my problem solving roots and my, my engineering roots and go, well, does it make my life better? 
if I if I if I start using this, does it make my life better, or does it give me the potential to to make my my life better? The origin idea of of Go Report actually was from a from a, from someone with another very similar mindset. It was it was founded in 2011, and it was a surveyor who actually worked in the shipyards who who came up with the idea. And he was really fed up with pen and paper, you know, having to carry physically carrying a lot of preparatory information with him to to wherever he was in the shipyard, actually collecting information at the point of the asset that he that he was at returning to the office to write it up, suffering the accuracy issues and the delay and all of this stuff about putting it back together again before he could actually provide any insight and guidance about what to do next and the action uh, of what to do next. And we kind of forget when things were invented. The first iPhone was released in 2007. The first iPad was was 2010. And really at the very start of the company, it really wasn't startup phase mode in those early years. You know, you were were talking about uh, an environment where people were thinking about these things as consumer tools rather than business tools people were you know there was a, there was a, there was work to do to bridge that gap that these are these are physical things that could be used in the uh, in the workplace so jumping forward very through a number of years um, through through a lot of others hard work and ingenuity i joined go report about 4 years ago to build on the you know the fantastic work of those who'd laid the, the foundations before me and we've really gone from sort of strength to strength over the last the last number of years we've over 450 clients across residential and commercial um, and they range from sole traders right up to large um, global multidisciplinary engineering practices so really our obviously today the main focus is around the the, the discussion is around the residential sector and in terms of it's important to us we're about 50 50 in terms of client number from residential and commercial so it's a very very high focus for us we Um, we do have other flavors of surveyor listen to this yes and (laughs) yes well that's and that's good and it is important because i think what we what we find is there are lessons to be learned from other industries also lessons to be learned from other Mm. other ranges of surveyors and what people do you know if if we can devise a solution that's dealing with hundreds of thousands of data points for hospital surveying for example the benefits of how you work with that information and process that information will translate down to you know doing volume work for for the residential side of things and mm-hmm. um, so there is there is a lot of crossover that we you know we try and borrow as much learnings from from wherever we can learn them and from other industries as well and as surveyors we can be quite sort of tunnel vision insular mm. in terms of what we we do because a lot of us just do that and there's only a handful of us that get involved in other sectors or do strange mm-hmm. things like have podcasts. We our focus goes in one way and it, you know, it really needs to be. When you were talking then just uh, about the iPads coming out in in 2010, I was just thinking what the hell were we using then in 2005? <laughs> well there, there were other but, there were other tablets. Yeah. yeah, 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 there were there were different types of te- technology and I mean really what forward thinking company to go ahead and do that at that mm-hmm. time in terms of investment trialing different things? You know, you can argue whether it was a good thing or a or a bad thing, but technology catches up with us all in in some way or you know some way, shape or form. And what I remember at the time is them saying we couldn't test, we didn't know what would happen after we had a hundred people on, so we would just test it and see. <laughs> and we were like live guinea pigs, you know, just doing it, doing it each time. But that was the way, way you know, just the way it was. And we had to be iterative and get it out there and, mm-hmm. and learn and try. And I suppose people, you know, nowadays, you know, you have things like digital project managers and test people and things like that. And I think I think as, as surveyors, whatever age you come into this profession, I think it's really useful to note you know, the difference, the transformation that's happened in the last 20, 25 years. Yeah. Personal lives as well as professional lives, I think is Mm, is incredible because it's it's not just changed how things can, you know, support your work and enhance your work, but it's actually changed how people interact with these things. You know, if I look at my children and how they interact with technology versus the way that I've had to learn to interact with technology versus the way my parents interact or don't interact with technology, as the case may be. So, you know, the, it does it does evolve. I think you mentioned there about the, you know, what were you using before? I, I can remember one of my first projects, we were trying to get better digital information at the source of assets. So effectively being able to better understand how, you know, huge pumps were performing, you know, at, while you were standing at the pump kind of thing. And this was kind of before the internet um, was really 
kind of ubiquitous. And it was also at a, at a point where a lot of business systems weren't browser based. So effectively, you know, they, they sat on premise in large server rooms and that kind of thing. No cloud computing in that in that sense. Now, there's a couple of things that are, are kind of interesting at that point. You know, one of the projects I worked on was how to build a, a stand that could be transported for a very heavy computer to be sat on while you were at a pump that you had to wheel into the room. And the second thing was, if you'd asked any IT manager at that time what they thought of cloud-based computing, they would have said over, the vast majority of them would have said over my dead body, would I have any of my information sitting in this thing that you call the cloud and not on-premise where I can totally control it? And I can't remember when that actually finished, but it's actually quite a rarity now to hold that opinion. Most of the tools we use are, are cloud-based because the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. Now, in saying that, what you also then need is running a, a software business or building a software business and growing a software business is is quite a concerted effort. It's not something you can really play at as such. You know, you have to you you have to employ the right kind of people and the right skill sets at each stage of your of your growth. You have to pay attention to things like you know independent security certification ISO twenty seven thousand and one, all those sorts of of things that matter and cost. Uh, and you have to be thinking. You have to stay abreast with other technologies to keep your technology relevant and all of those those things. So there's quite a there's quite a concerted effort with all of those things. And whenever you said there, there was the sort of try it out and wait until it broke kind of approach, it, that still happens. W what happens, you know, businesses like ours, we we don't do it that way because we're not at that scale. But you saw most recently with things like ChatGBT, you know, they mm, released yeah. it out there. And, you, you you know, after using it for about a, or after it being live for about a week, the messages started going, there are too many people using it now. We can't, we can't keep up with the demand. We have to scale up, et cetera. So for large scale things, it still happens. At the, at the level we we kind of operate at, that wouldn't be the approach we would take because we scale in advance of of our growth effectively. All of which requires a lot of a lot of concerted effort. Yeah, and you say that reminds me of um, even if you go on the boots, the chemist website, you get allocated a little slot to go in, and <laughs> you know, so it is like waiting in the queue <laughs> at the at the chemist. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's also looking at how people utilize the technology. You know, you're never going to really know what it's like and how you use it. And I remember the tablets when they first came out, I found them quite heavy. I'm a lot smaller than some mm -hmm. other guys. Um, I used to carry it like a, a crossbody oh, handbag, yeah. Yeah. which yeah. was fine. But they gave us, we had a choice of a rucksack or <laughs> a big, one of those big chunky briefcases on wheels. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I may even have one in the loft. I'll have to see if I can find one and take a picture <laughs> uh, because, you know, nothing was getting getting through that. But then most people, you know, the practicalities of it, you'd leave it up, up, upstairs, you'd put it down. You know, it's how you, the whole user experience, which comes back to being individuals the, you know, at, the end of the, <laughs> at the end of the day and how, how you're going to, you know, use something. Yeah. And I, I think that the, the key thing is always that, that I always come come back to really is, you know, what, why do we sort of said who, who go reporter, you know, but what, what are we really, you know, we're, we're, we're a bunch of individuals who come together that literally get up every day to serve the survey, surveying community. You know, that's, that's what our guys do. You know, we have a great core team who kind of experience more sur surveying activity in a, in a month than many surveyors do in a year kind of thing, just because just the sheer um, weight of interactions that we have. And, and ultimately everything we do is measured against is it in our client's best interests effectively you know whether whether we get that right or wrong is is really determined by how long clients stay with us um which you know fortunately is very good but we we never lose sight of that kind of thing so when we look at evolution the one thing we know about it is things are going to evolve and change so you don't necessarily know where they'll get to you don't have to have a crystal ball because it's not really that important about where they get to it's that you're prepared to evolve with the change kind of thing um i had a little um weekend trip with my son who's 11 and we did a little museum trip to london at the weekend and and um, we were going around the science museum and uh, we were walking you know the, the exhibit where it shows the evolution of products and stuff and i i pointed at a computer a commodore and went actually that was my first computer i got that at your age and honestly it took him about half an hour to stop laughing right it was mm -hmm. like what what could you possibly have done with that dad you know that kind of thing and you know so it that's it within a lifetime that's within a you know within a generation or, or a couple of generations kind of thing so we know it's going to change we know technology is going to evolve 
the key thing is to evolve with it in line with what you're actually getting paid to do effectively. And that's, you know, not, not overly worry about the bigger picture, as long as your, your individual picture is improving and enhancing kind of thing. And it's, and it's investing in something in your business, you know, just like, like people, you know, all sorts of other kind of uh, technology that's going to grow with you. So it's not like a, when I speak to people about, and they, you know, they talk about technology, you know, we need to change, get on, you know, get on the tablets, Marion, and that mm-hmm. sounds terrible, doesn't it? But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe also true, but you know. Also true. Uh, but they're looking for that, that silver bullet. Yes. You know, this will yes. fix my problems. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really hard to do that when you don't fully understand it and you're not an expert mm-hmm. in it. You're a, you're a surveyor, mm-hmm. you know, not, not an expert IT person. You know, and so it's really, and when you're tired at the end of the day and you're trying to make it work and it doesn't, you haven't got that support around you. So it's mm-hmm. got to be considered where you've got to know your business well and start to sort of zoom in and zoom out a bit, if you like, of well, where are things going? And you've got to be thinking about risk and about regulation and how flexible can a, a product, a digital product or whatever be so that mm-hmm. if things change, just like, you know, through the pandemic, we all had to pivot didn't we? You know, I've never done as much in. pivoting in my life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all had to ha- had to do that, didn't we? To see yeah. how we could do things differently and how how quickly we we could. And some fared better than others. And yeah. we also learned why it was good to stick with the old ways. You know, what to pick and what to what to choose. But it's it's not a silver bullet, and it's really hard. And a lot of the surveyors that I speak to, and, I, and I, you know, this is where you get the you've tried something and it doesn't mm-hmm. work, and you've been burnt. Sometimes it's not the, the the product or the technology or whatever. It's it wasn't right at the time, and you weren't in the right mindset, and you didn't get get the right support. What can you? I mean, I'm sure you see that. What can you? I'm interested in, in the view that you have as on the edge of the profession, if you like, looking in of what you mm-hmm. what you see mm-hmm. with surveyors. Well, I think you know, it, in terms of being on the the edge of the, I, I come with, with with different perspectives from, you know, from, from working in other sectors, but in terms of what we do, we're very much, very much immersed in the profession as such. We're just not out surveying. We're, we're, we're actually providing solutions for people who are out every day surveying. So the, the thing about it is the generic kind of, kind of thing. There is never a perfect time to implement any form of change. You're either, you're either, at a point where you're doing so well, you're so busy that you don't have time to look at it, or you're at a point where you're not busy enough and you're solely focused on winning enough work to stay in business effectively. There's no never a, a happy time, um, or there's never a perfect time, I should say. The 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 right thought to have is where where's my business going? You know, that that is the whole point is where's my business going and what kind of what kind of environment do I want to work in? And and that will be it will be dependent on whether you feel yourself that you want to stay as a sole trader or you actually want to grow your business or you're actually part of a corporate where lots of people and lots of mouths to feed that you you have to do. So although we there's probably very little we haven't seen, we kind of treat everybody that speaks to us as a very individual scenario. What are your challenges? What's your desire for this? So we, we'd have a client who you know literally has a, an external interest that they want to spend more time on, but they can only do that if they earn enough money doing what they're doing, they just want to get back time effectively. Um, and, and that was their motivation. Where, whereas we have others that say, look, you know, I, I'm starting as a sole trader, but I want to grow and I want, I want to evolve my service offering. So I need a, I need a platform that's going to allow me to do that. It's not just delivering one solution. It, I, I want it to be able to deliver solutions I haven't thought of yet. You know, a typical thing at the moment might be I'm doing a level two. I want to move up to a level three, but I also want to do snagging. I want to do new build work, all of those sorts of things. I need a platform that can evolve to do all of those in, in line with the way I want to do it. And if I employ additional people, how do I manage my risk of having other people operating under my name? So those are all things that you need to really understand. And so I guess my advice to to anyone looking at technology is don't be shy, you know, particularly if you're a sole trader, get involved in open engagement. You know, any engagement with a software vendor is is effectively free education and learning for both parties. You know, a, a prospect, as, as it would be termed, not a client, a prospect is in total control of the engagement. The software vendor's role is to help you come to an informed decision. I think 
what I see a lot is people standing off and maybe not sharing as much as they could share in order to get them to the to to their own informed decision. I would say, you know, arrange a call, talk through your challenges, allow whatever vendor you choose. They should be listening to you and finding out more about your challenges and motivations and then sharing their knowledge and experience with you. You know, a bad experience that we all encounter on a regular basis, there's no doubt about this, you know, where you feel you're being pulled in a direction where there's no point of return. It's almost like as soon as I start talking, I don't get out of this unless I sign a contract yeah. kind of thing. And you shouldn't mm. really, you shouldn't really, a good, a good vendor won't behave like that. And, and what you actually find, a lot of the people that, that, you know, that sign up with us as clients, one of the things that's always really common, they find it very cathartic to express all of their problems and challenges to an independent observer because they're not, they're not telling their peer group. They don't have to hide mm. and they, they can say, you know, I find it really difficult to do X, Y, and Z. I find it really hard to operate in this way. I find it really hard to, you know, get enough done in a day. Am I taking too long? Is it because I'm going into too much detail? You know, how do other people feel about this kind of thing? Second piece of advice really is, is, is be open and, and transparent. Tell your story warts and all, you know, you're, you know, whatever we don't, you know, we're very confidential about our engagements, you know, and a good, a good, a good vendor will align your challenges and aspirations with the solution. And they will also tell you if they're, if they're not the right fit for you. You know, we're, we're not really interested in buy and die as a, as a, as a client kind of thing. We're interested in long-term relationships. And if it's not the right fit from the, from the get-go, you know, we'll, we'll say, you know, are you ready yet? Yeah, really is this, you know, is this this is your decision? Are you ready to move move forward with that? And then, the, really, the the final piece of advice, and um, there's there's obviously lots more detail you can go into, but the final piece of advice is make your own mind up. And I and I kind of I kind of point at sort of feedback loops and social media a little bit in this as well, because it's very easy for social media to be an echo chamber of whatever thought you put out there kind of thing. And I, I would say the best piece of advice I could give is treat positive feedback in the exact same way as negative feedback. And people don't. People, as human nature, we tend to think because one negative piece of feedback is that that's it, everything's terrible, whereas one piece of positive feedback, it, everything is wonderful. And I think that you should treat them both the same because you don't know the motivations of the person giving you that feedback either, uh, effectively. So I would always say, you know, come direct to the, the vendor, talk directly to them. But when you do, tell them the negative feedback you've heard. It, you know, our guys, you know, they, they get up every day to have conversations in the surveying world. They love it so much better when somebody says, I heard your product was x y or z because then they can immediately go okay let me give you a counter view to that right right away let's address that right away and then move on to the other stuff kind of thing and in the same way if you say well you know i heard your software was really good and people really love working with you tell me a bit more about that well that gives us an opportunity then to share with you what other companies have done to make their implementation successful you know if you've got if you've got one company who uses the same software doing the same job, doing really well with it and really well as a business, and another that isn't with the same software, it's clearly not the software that's the common factor. It's the other aspects around it that are common factor. You know, there's lots more little bits of advice that whenever you, you talk to a vendor yes. that can help. That's really interesting. Have I said that before? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll keep taking you'll, it. You'll, you'll, you'll take it. <laughs> I think you're right in terms of are you ready? Yeah. You know, are you yeah. and that goes back to things that we we mentioned before about understanding your business enough. One of the things that I find with the surveyors and small businesses that I coach and a mentor is that we have a problem with sales. Mm -hmm. We either don't charge enough on our fee. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. of us do not like the sales conversation. We'd rather stick pins in our eyes than talk to people. You know, not not everybody. Some some mm -hmm. love it, but we have a problem with with sales and because this is a such a you know, quite transformational for a, a business to go to go digital it's a big step it's not, mm -hmm. a, not a small yeah. step yeah and there is another level of anxiety behind yeah. that yeah. and therefore you know when you're talking to you know the different providers of whatever software technology there's a lot more riding on it than just let's just yeah. have a chat and find out about yeah. your but your but your software and I, so I think there's an element of if you're looking thinking of going down a digital route or investing in new technology or whatever it is, is to be prepared. Be prepared. Mm -hmm. Do some mm -hmm. do some research. Ask who who is who's using what. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Do they enjoy it? What works? What what doesn't mm -hmm. work? But but absolutely know that you know there's positive as well, and that what works for somebody else might not work for you. 
uh, you know for you yeah. too it's like an interview isn't it like a date you know have a list of questions and and worries and and, and you'll get a fe- I think you can have you get a, a feel for it right? it's always a the problem is sometimes you speak to the salesperson on the stand or doing the demo but that's mm-hmm. not the person mm-hmm. that you'll do with day to day because it's got to be quite a trusted relationship Oh, long term. Absolutely. I mean, mm. our, our business, we're very heavily weighted towards customer care consult- consultancy and the, the product development side of things. We we kind of, it's, it may sound a bit trite, but we, we call our, our sales business development people educators, really, because the vast majority of people that we're interacting with are moving from pen and paper. Um, they're not moving from other digital solutions, they're moving from pen and paper. And, you know, what what, what we know about that is if you're if you're a sole trader, it's probably your biggest single investment in technology that you, you're going to make, really, when you look at, you know, the severe toolkit mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. So you have to have empathy with that. Um, you have to have empathy with the fear factor. I, I haven't tried this before, but I've heard it's good. What, what do we do? How, do? how do we go about moving forward with it? But what we also know is what it takes to be successful. So we share that. You know, that's you, when I say talking to a good vendor is free knowledge. It really is because we're talking to so many other people in the industry and we're trying to look at what the industry should be aspiring to so we can share that there's no there's no loss there's no loss to be open and and talk directly do come armed do set aside that really you know for for a lot of the residential work that we do if you set set aside one hour you're going to be tremendously well informed you might take might need a little bit longer to make your decision you might you know you might need a month or two you might need 6 months you might need a year right it doesn't really matter but as long as that engagement has paid back for you so you know arrange a time that's convenient for you our guys are pretty flexible with that you know we we know our the vast majority of our users are fee earners right so they they're out and about and a lot of the problem is they're fee earners and they're out and about too much because they're having to do too much work so we know that but like i said the big thing is have a direct conversation and make your own mind up that's that's what it's about it's about informed decision making can i ask you about accessibility mm mm-hmm. A lot of surveyors that I come across are neurodiverse or have physical challenges, yep. but still are out on the ladders doing the job. Yep. How how mm. can digital help with that? Or, um, what's your, or what's your experience <clears throat> with surveyors who perhaps had some challenges? Well, well, obviously it's it's such a wide subject area, and you know the 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 scale and issue with neurodivergence and and what how it impacts you or or what way it impacts you is is quite large and wide and and interestingly the engineering profession has a you know as a very similar kind of demographic as uh, as well of people mm-hmm. i don't know whether it's you know what what attracts people to the industry what what people find within the industries that you use and and that, that kind of the, the things that really are are interesting aspects because i think that kind of that kind of level of diversity um creates really interesting solutions effectively yeah. it really really does and i think that in terms of you know some of the examples that i might use you know where where somebody perhaps has a form of dyslexia or issue with um that side of things built into our product we have a, a concept of response management so in residential phrases kind of group does standard phrases and it gets a very negative connotation you know i, I always see these arguments about Standard phrases, well, it's commoditized and it's not a checkbook. That's not the point of standard phrases at all. The standard phrase is not to to remove the need for the surveyor to put their their information in in a way that that explains the situation. But there are things that you say on a frequent basis. There are oh, aspects of things that you yeah. do a lot of. And so there is an efficiency with being able to manage those phrases, but there's also an efficiency in using them as starter points kind of thing. So we would have people who maybe have a bit of an issue on that side of things would rely on the standard phrase because they only need to get them kind of proofread once effectively and then can use them in the software. And then it just means they're much closer to the end result uh, effectively. There are other aspects, you know, obviously this is a, this is an audio podcast, but I am showing you a, a little iPad here with a little holder thing kind of on it, on it. And that, that sort of ability to work with an iPad with one hand while you're opening and closing doors and that kind of thing is part of the overall solution effectively. And then there are, you know, there are other aspects in the tool about how the information is presented on the screen. We try to keep it clear. We try to keep it logical and, and just helping people with that, with that aspect. And it's quite difficult for some people who wouldn't necessarily regard themselves as having a, a, dis- a difficulty, a disability mm-hmm. or, a, or a problem, but it is okay to say, you know, actually I struggle with 
red and green colours, can the screen do something different for me? It's having that conversation, isn't it? And building up that trust. Because if you're not yeah, yeah. sharing yeah. that, then how can... How can yeah, it's, where, it's what I said about being um, being really open and transparent, you know, telling telling your, telling your us your challenge, warts and all, effectively. Because, you know, the worst thing to do is is to not say and then feel disappointed in the experience. It's much better to say, I've got, a, you know, an issue of this. And for us to be honest and say, well, we could, we could do this that would help. Or... Actually, there's, we can't do anything to help with that. You know, that's that that's not something that we we can envisage anybody can do with. But is there any other aspect that we can do to to mm -hmm. to, to ease your path, kind of thing? And fortunately, I, I don't know whether it, I suppose mo the more the more if if an individual has kind of come to terms with it more, they they're generally pretty upfront with us. You know, we we mm -hmm. we do have a lot of conversations in this area, uh, and so the more you know, we we are getting we do get people who who tell us upright and explain the situation, and then that you know that helps us a lot in the relationship. And I think longer term as well, you know, the key thing as well, a lot of software companies are very heavily loaded on sales at the front end. Now, obviously. We're all involved in sales. <laughs> Surveyors are involved in sales as well. It doesn't matter how good or enjoyable you find your work. If you're not doing the work, you're not, you're not earning a living at it. But I think the key thing is a solution like this has to evolve with your business and as things change for you. And so, um, you know, that is a key aspect of evaluating a vendor that you're going to work with is year on year, because that's the way we work year on year. Uh, are these guys evolving with me? Are they are they moving what they're doing onwards in the way that the surveying industry wants them to, to move on? Or are they bringing things to the table that surveyors should be, should aspire to that maybe aren't going to think of themselves? You mentioned standard paragraphs, mm -hmm. and you're right. You know that's hot, hot topic, hot topic, <laughs> as they call it. And the fact is, it is an efficiency because there are things that you would like to say in your own way on every report. It's just the way that you write your report. And there's sometimes we have these standard paragraphs as caveats to get us out what we think we'll get us out of a claim and yeah. generally it's the opposite we put we put too much in uh, but they're there as a uh, you know some people use them as a prompt some people just use them as a get my brain in gear after I've had my cup of tea after being out on site <laughs> and, and start writing but it's the it's the reflection and the editing and and getting it right afterwards that you know the the magic of surveying if you like comes yeah. together can I ask you about you know you mentioned chat GPT before mm -hmm. What are your views? I'm going to say views. What are your thoughts or your insights <laughs> on on that? Um, and can you see that coming into surveying? Because we often hear surveyors, we're far behind when it comes to prop tech. Mm, and then mm. they just think, well, we don't need a lot of tech. I think we're doing all right with a mobile phone and a <laughs> whatever it is we've got, you know? Yeah. I, I think um, we, we shy, well, I, I certainly... Um since I get kind of came in to go report of, of, of sort of put a bit of distance between the kind of the phrase prop tech and, and go report, you know, we're, we're a business solution for surveying prop tech as a, as a, as a word, as a phrase is, it's kind of, it's really good for people who organize events. You know, how do you group as many people as you possibly can to get people to exhibit? And I'm being, you know, slightly facetious with that, but that's, you know, that's the, the history. So, you, know, you, so you don't want to be in the property technology area. You want to be where the fun guys are. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, well, the, the the issue is that covers it covers too much ground. So we work is classed as prop tech, um, mm. and you know that that's the the stuff of documentaries, really. And you know there are lots of other other things like that. We kind of look at it and go, okay, well, again, back to the problem. What are we trying to solve? Who are we trying to solve it for? What is their um, likely expectation and aspiration? And and how do we apply what's available to us in a cost effective way to to to, to make that happen? So when you look at something like ChatGPT or other other AIs are available, and it's a really interesting thing. The one thing we do know that history tells us is you don't stop technology evolving into into your lives in, in what way. I think that you get the, the first waves of it, you kind of get this, you know, eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago, it was very dated, you know, January, February time, you get this massive wave of interest and lots of people posting, I put this in and this is what I got out and that kind of thing. And you see this massive wave and then you start to see the wave of concern and okay, well, where's this information coming from? How reliable is it? What, what happens, you know, if I was a content creator now, you know, have I seen find away my rights for this tool to use what I've what I've put out there kind of thing. So these are you know these are all natural waves of any kind of evolutionary thing. What we do know is it will come in in some 
some way or or some form probably not the way it is now but it it, it will start to um to come in and my wife's a teacher um we talk about it from an education point of view as as well and and kids using it and teachers using it to prepare lessons it's not just kids using it to plagiarize yeah. or get things right it's teachers using it to prepare lessons and that kind of thing i always go back to the same thing it will find a way i'm i'm a practical optimist i like to think that um yes people can be bad actors and people can do things wrong but i like to think that a, a as as there's enough good intentions that will evolve something into something that's useful and will start to address the downsides and the concerns and we will adapt to it. I think I saw something, you know, recently about protests against calculators in the maths classroom at one point in time. And whenever I um when I started in sort of professional engineering at 22, 23 in the graduate scheme, one of the sort of elder statesmen said, Oh, you know, you're gonna have to convince the Luddites. And I'm I'm like well, the, the the what now? The who now? Who, who are they? <laughs> You know, and, the, you know, there was a movement in this, whatever it was, the 1600s mm-hmm. to against machinery and that kind of thing. So it's a natural it's a natural progression. We have to learn to adapt to it. I don't think we have to learn to adapt to the way it is now, but we will learn to adapt to the way it comes in and is used. Now, in terms of the surveying world, what do we what do we know? Well, we know that knowledge sharing is is very important you can't be an expert in everything you can't know the answer to everything a lot one of the great things about the profession is as time moves on your experience grows because the things you see happen more often so people will be looking for how do i accelerate that knowledge learn how do i how do i improve my access to a wider sense of experience so i can see the benefits of Machine learning, really, rather than AI coming into those things. But the same principles that have always been there, validate your sources, check more than one. I think the difference with AI, with things like ChatGPT, it's harder to validate the source because it could be multiple sources of the same thing giving you the answer, which is what people are saying when they see crazy answers coming up and that kind of thing. So long story short, it's coming. We, We will evolve and we will use it for the better, I think. I, th- I think it's a. I think it's an interesting time. I think it's something that surveyors shouldn't be scared of. No, we've, not at all. you know we've evolved so much. I mean, hey, if we can go from <laughs> the tablets that we used to, <laughs> feel like, a bit like the Flintstones. Remember the big stone things that used to have. They weigh. They weighed as much as well. Um, I think you're really the... you're really scarred by this, Marin. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a very unhappy time in your career, <laughs> having it to lug this massive machinery around. <laughs> uh, no, do you know it was. It was just. It, it was interesting. It was groundbreaking in many ways i just felt quite out of sync with it yeah you know yeah. in that i wasn't a yeah, and that shouldn't yeah and that shouldn't, shouldn't and, be the way. And, and i still feel like that now today and i'm sure the, mm-hmm. it'll resonate with them um, with other people and i think the, the thing that i would say for what i've seen and, and and used and experienced is that you know there are huge benefits in you know using that kind of technology i mean you know we use it in grammarly you know that mm-hmm. kind of thing yeah, anyway, which improves yeah. your, yeah. your 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 mm-hmm. writing in paragraphs. But if we can get over what we want to with clients much mm-hmm. better, then that's clearly going to be a win. We've still got to diagnose and our thoughts and that and that process it process it. So it's almost standard paragraphs in a another way, if you like. But I think the difference or what we need to be thinking about is yes, we can use this kind of technology to do what we do better. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. in what will probably happen is we will do a totally different way. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they're talking about not necessarily home information packs and sellers packs like we, mm-hmm. we used to have, but the technology is there now to provide better services, to be more joined up, to have that that collaboration. And so we'll be using this in a different landscape, I, I would yeah. predict. I, 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 yeah, I mean, I think the... You know, the, the real important thing is that, from my viewpoint, commoditization of surveying activity is, is a really, really poor result for the consumer, right? Particularly in, in mm-hmm. residential, it's a really poor result for, for you know, you, you mentioned about fees, I think, you know, protecting the value and by developing services and insight for the consumer that, 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 that really add value. You know, clearly there is an issue in the general public, the general consumer understanding of surveying and residential surveying and what it is that is of value, you know, the difference between evaluation versus a level three and that kind of thing. And, you know, I know that from personal experience when I've been advise, advising friends and, um, you know, I'm usually the first port of call for a lot of my friends when they're changing properties or have an issue and that kind of thing. And there's a very large informal network out there that participate in what surveyors do. I think the important thing is the report that is produced is not the product. 
the report is a very key part of the product, but how you engage with the consumer before the survey, during the survey and post the survey is the product effectively. And any tools or any combination of tools, which I think is very important, is a combination of tools that allow that product to be better for the consumer generates better value, I think, for um, for everyone. I, I Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. One of the things I would always say just to finish on is we provide a service. Yep. You know, when you start to give a product, that's when yep. in people's mindset it goes into an insurance guarantee. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then yeah. that, that yeah. piece of paper in my in my hand, but we're offering a service. And yeah. if we can make the paper based stuff easier, quicker, more efficient, creates sure more time. Need it, all of those things yeah. creates, creates more, more time, time for the service to deliver yeah. the service. Yeah, ultimately. Absolutely. Gavin, it's been lovely to speak to you today. Thank you ever so much. You're very welcome. And thank you very much for the invite. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to take a look at the show notes when you get a chance for all the resources and links we mentioned in the session. If you find these podcasts helpful, don't forget you can buy me a coffee, drop me a quick note to say thank you or leave a review and take a look at our free resources in the community on the Love Surveying website. I'll see you next time.